Great to be here. Thank you for having me. And it's my first time in Finland. And uh, I haven't gone to a sauna yet, so I'm very uh, looking forward to that in that way. Um, so just to give you a little bit of uh, a background, uh, I, you know, um, come from a humanitarian sort of background. And but when I was an undergrad, I studied film. And it's a lot of this work is kind of a combination between film and humanitarianism. And somehow VR got thrown in there as an opportunity to be able to translate that vision and that dream I always had to really kind of let people experience what I would experience when I would be in the field. And I think for a lot of humanitarians, they don't admit it, but there is a part of it that is about helping others, but there's also a selfish part that is about the people and the experiences and the nuance and the resilience and the absolute incredible character of so many of these places and people that becomes addictive, where you don't want to come home to, you know, you, you want to be abroad to really get a sense of, you know, um, having that same experience again of what people go through and how it works. So a lot of the work is, is that way. Um, hopefully, I'm very, for a VR person, I'm technically very, not very savvy, so we're going to see how this works. Um, so this talk, um, I'll try not, to, I might skip over some things in the interest of time. Um, I wanted to start out a little bit that's a bit more philosophical uh, because when I was given the opportunity, and I was very privileged to have the opportunity to shoot some of the first live action 360 VR on behalf of the United Nations, and that was around December 2014. And I had to think about it uh, because like a lot of people have mentioned here, uh, we still haven't figured out the grammar of VR back then it was totally unknown of whether it would even work. Because when I wanted to do and use VR for humanitarian purposes to build empathy, most people thought it's not going to work or this is only you know, for roller coasters, this is only for entertainment. And in some ways, there wasn't really that concept that this could work. So, um, you know, a lot of it came with people just saying, you know, you can't really direct in VR, or all you really need to do if you can is just show what's happening to people. There wasn't a lot of thought going into it, and it didn't seem completely intuitive or right to me of how that would work. Um, so, what is the essence of what a lot of what I was trying to do at the UN? And I think it goes to, in a way, if we're trying to get people to care about other people, we're somehow representing that pain and kind of trying to translate a lot of the difficult situations that people go through, but in a way, have you care about it. Um, and you know, this, isn't, this has kind of been something that isn't new. You know, from, there's something very human about always saying, this is what happened, and I want to try to tell you a story about what happened. And this is somewhere, you know, with, before the dawn of photography, you know, in our paint, this is from the Napoleonic era, and this is really, again, just trying to always say, you couldn't be there, but this is something we want to express. This was bad, there was conflict, there was suffering. And this is one of the first sort of photographs that come from the American Civil War. And I really like this, I don't know if there's a, there's, I, I forgot to get a pointer, but in the other side of that is a battleground and on this hill are politicians and civilians all trying to understand, again, what's happening. And the camera now is moving. It's moving in because you can get more realist. You can get a greater understanding. So when I was doing VR, it's the most real, authentic, you're absolutely there. But I realized that this isn't the first time that there's a new medium that's trying to explain what's happening in conflict, what's happening to others in some ways. So many people would say World War I was probably the first photographed war where photography played a very 
novel role in trying to explain what was happening with the violence and what's going on. Vietnam is often credited as being the first sort of televised war, where these television images are coming into your home for the first time. Again, shifting your relationship to the violence, the conflict, the suffering of what's happening. Syria is by many considered the first YouTube war, where if you go on YouTube, uh, you will find a lot of first-person user-generated content of the most horrific things. Um, and in more recent times, Black Lives Matter uh, in the United States, there was the first live killing of somebody happening. And again, the intuitive thing for a lot of people is, with VR or anything, just show the suffering, because that's what has been happening uh, in, in that way. If I have a point, and if I have a little philosophical thing, and a lot of it you know, is based on, on Susan Sontag, who's uh, um, she's passed away, but she was a preeminent uh, philosopher and thinker from New York who wrote a lot about photography and images. If I have a point, you can't just show the suffering of others. There has to be a deeper approach. There has to be storytelling in it. Because this is from World War I. There was a, a book called War Against War that was basically 40 of the worst pictures you can imagine from World War I that were put into a book and sold and passed around. And in 1930, there were 10 editions of this book in Germany and all over the world. It was translated in many languages. And many pacifists and many people used it as a tool to say, look what happens if we go to war again. But as we know, that didn't necessarily stop the war. And it doesn't do it. And so we're going to go through a little bit of why. Here's some you know, early footage on TV from Vietnam. Again, trying to show you how horrible things are. And it doesn't necessarily stop you from going forward. This is something, I won't play this too much because it could be you know, traumatic, but these are, this is just an example of some Syrian footage that you can find uh, online. And when I talk to a lot of Syrian activists, they always say, if only the world can see this, the war will stop. But it doesn't stop. It doesn't stop. And the same thing with Black Lives Matter, I've seen it, or you know, let's just, let's just get people access to all these horrible things happening. So why doesn't it work? Well, one, very obviously we grow numb to these types of images. We're living in an age now where you're probably more exposed to horrible things than ever before in the history of, of what's happening. And it doesn't necessarily, after a while, have the same effect on you. And Susan Sontag, you know, really kind of illustrates that. And I really, reg I really like, you know, <clears throat> I can't stress enough how important a lot of her work is to think about it, because I think it's some of the most um, convincing stuff. Um, you know, you have pictures like this that, you know, of Ilan, who's the three-year-old boy who washed up. And I think, you know, it might have motivated you in some ways, but the question is if you keep seeing this over and over and over, because there are many Ilans, uh, what does it do? Does it stop the suffering? And I don't think it has. And, you know, I think it's important to understand why and change that approach. Um, you know, in UNICEF, and I have a lot of experience with the United Nations, and I still do a lot of work with them, and I'm an advisor with them, uh, this was acceptable ways of showing and motivating people to care about what's happening uh, in far off places. And, you know, this is Audrey Hepburn, and, you know, it, you might look at it now and cringe, but in some ways, that was their thinking. We, have, we, we can use photographic means if we can just show it. And a lot of what happened in the 80s with Live Aid you know, is a, an example of that. But this isn't something that works or keeps working over time. Um, let's just play this a little bit. Every year, 10 million third world children don't live to see their third birthday. Those who do live beyond that ripe old age here will grow up in dung heaps like this. Happy birthday. I've been asked if I've ever gotten used to this misery. How does a human being with a heart get used to this? The heartbreaking crying of a two-year-old so undernourished her teeth are coming loose. The sight of a child so starved he's too weak to cry. And one so dehydrated by diarrhea he doesn't even have the tears to cry with. 
Now, I can't get used to this any more than you could, but we can get rid of it. Yes, we can. You and I and CCF. Your 70 cents will put life-giving medicine into a dying little body. Nourishing. Okay, I won't play too much of that. Um, that was, again, um, a very common approach to what it is. If I played this in the United States, it'd be very funny, by the way. And you, people would laugh because it's very easy to make fun of Sally Struthers. But uh, it's a tough crowd here, Jesus. Uh, and, but, you know, the point is, the photography, again, trying to do it. In TV, you would have these things. But people stop doing it. And people think people stop doing it because of human dignity. But you know what? It's always about money. No, it's not always about money. But money has a big part of it because that approach stopped working after a while. So much so that if you go into a UNICEF website now, uh, that isn't the approach because they found that it's actually more effective to kind of show a nuance, show people also smiling, doing better, building a little bit of storytelling and actually getting the voices of people that are going through things. And so I think, you know, a lot of it is to understand that it's because you grow numb and in some ways you need to build in a little bit more nuanced things that actually make a lot of fundraising a lot more successful. So the approach I knew we had to take with VR had to be in some ways not suffering, but my, my sort of critique, you know, I think you have to be self-critical. My critique of some of the UNICEF approach now is it's a little bit too happy, you know, and a little bit too many smiling children. And I think something about VR can kind of give you some of the difficulty and bring in a little bit of balance and nuance to what's happening. Uh, another reason it doesn't really work just to show shocking images is that, I don't know if you... I showed this slide to somebody in, uh, where I was in New Zealand, and it's about having, you know, I said, you know, we have this lustful relationship to violence, and he was adamant that it wasn't him that has that, you know, that it's only other people. But, you know, we all have this inner dark side that we are attracted to horrible things, and they might just be attractive, but they're not necessarily going to motivate us to change things. And, you know, a big example of that is, you know, on highways when there's accidents, many people will slow down and try to want to see things, but they're not necessarily going to, to always do something to help out in that way. And I think there's a lot of images that exploit and do that where a lot of it is just this inner thing where it can only end up serving to feed our attraction to those images rather than to actually spur change. So, again, using sensational shocking images are not really what it is. Um, another reason is a lot of it can be exploited. I can show you a suffering of someone and you can be motivated, but for someone else that can be very different, right? So this is, you know, an example of where, you know, people here are watching this violence and they're very happy about it in some ways, or they have a different relationship with it. So I can show you the suffering of an African-American, but if you're racist, that doesn't make you, that actually makes you, can make you happy. And that can be something that you use for other propagandic purposes. The same picture of Ilan that was used in Europe to motivate people to care about refugees was used by ISIS to show people, this is what happens if you leave. And I think that's the kind of trap when you kind of just try to show horrible things. Um, and I think VR has this sort of ability, this incredible thing, where you're able to kind of build in the ordinary experience and make it extraordinary. There are things in VR that work that are shocking. I don't understand why they work, and people tell me about it. For example, in one of the films I did on Gaza, it's a very simple scene of looking out the window with a child next to you. And just that very simple act of having a child next to you and looking out the window into some rubble, many people feel very moved about it because it's the embodiment, it's the authenticity that I think comes within this medium that I think is still mysterious and I think it's still important to understand how it works um, in that way. Just to kind of review a bit, um, you know, sensational shocking pictures I think kill storytelling, um, and some of the best examples of that I know is the show, a documentary by Cloud Landsman that uses no archival footage uh, and is not trying to get your sympathy or get your empathy 
through these images, it's through storytelling, it's through testimony, it's through, you know, to, to getting you to use your imagination in some ways of what happened. And I think that's important, that I think imagination and being able to allow for some space in that, even within a VR space, uh, is what allows for the empathy to happen. Some good examples so I don't depress you and you can kind of have some hope of what works. Um, this is a really good film called Silvered Water, which actually takes a lot of YouTube footage from Syria and builds a narrative around it that I think is quite compelling and interesting on how to kind of get you to care uh, rather than it just being sensational. There's other sort of images, you know, that are more historic that are a little bit more, you know, allow you to kind of have to use your sort of ability to kind of imagine and think what someone is going through. Um, my latest film is called The Last Goodbye, and I did a, um, it's a Vive walk-around experience on the Holocaust, and I had to do research with this. And I went into museums and tried to find what was there from the camps that I was, I was filming at. And, uh, you know, this one by itself, is just what it is. It's people in the camp, and you know, this is another one in that way. But the caption to it was that this is the absolute last moment before somebody, before all these people go into the gas chamber, right? And having that context gives you the chills and makes you look at the picture in a much different way of the woman there with her pursed lip, or this maybe older brother holding the hands of his younger brothers as they're about to face their, their death uh, in that way. And I think that is what we have to kind of always still bring to a VR experience because it's very easy because we can get seduced by VR. You can get absolutely, you can get people just to get lazy on the storytelling because it's gonna be this wow factor. And I think that is not what's going to keep and make something timeless and great. Um, it's always going to be the story. I mean, I can... Brothers Karamazov is always going to be a great book, right? No matter, even if it's in this old antiquated form of words. So I think that's what you have to come to with a lot of, a lot of this sort of work. Um, so we're a third way done. Congratulations, we only have two more parts of this talk. Is everybody okay? All right, that's right, get a little bit animated over here. All right. You're not boring in Finland, are you? No, all right. That didn't go over well. Um, so why, why did I do this? To give you another context. Um, a lot of social humanitarian stories feels like eating your vegetables, right? It always has this thing where I would always feel this frustration in the humanitarian world of how we wanted people to engage with the most important issues that matter on earth, right? And in general, you know, I looked at how it was, and it's not just to the UN, it, I think a lot of it is to a lot of other NGOs or a lot of ways how we think about it. It never really, you know, clicked for me. And so the old way of doing it when you care about something at the UN is you call these guys, you know? And I won't mention their names. Um, but they are the ones that we say, help us get the message out in some ways. And I think over time, I saw that this became less and less effective uh, in some ways. If you go to the UN's YouTube channel as well, for the most important issues of our time, if you look at some of the view counts of what it is, it's abysmal. And I don't think that's because people don't care. I think, again, there needs to be a new approach to this storytelling. And I think VR has that ability, finally, to kind of build and really work to the strengths of a lot of this type of empathy building and talking. Because, you know, a lot of, you know, this is, this is, you know, some of what you can like look at it and you'll see that a lot of it is still about what we're doing and it's not necessarily human or first person focused is what we're trying to do. You know, if you get Angelina Jolie, of course you get a little bit more, a little bit more bump. But what we're really up against is, is something like this, where you, know, you get millions of hits for um, you know, cat videos and other things. So the idea was when we were building some of this stuff to think, is it possible to kind of do this in a better way? Um, before VR, I just, I'm gonna go through this quick. You can check out this um, 
I, this was my first sort of like foray into you know, this sort of first person storytelling that's not VR, it's called Keep the Oil on the Ground. And I made it for the Climate Change Summit at the UN. And again, it was an exploration in trying to create a new way of telling stories that are first person oriented. Uh, there's a very famous blogger on the streets of New York called uh, Humans of New York. And I produced his UN tour uh, also that again tries to bring in like the human story, which I think again informed a lot of the work that I was doing then with VR. Um, so why VR? And what is it about empathy? Um, you know, there is, um, it's important to kind of define and think about what are some of the ways, what we mean by empathy, uh, because I know there are certain definitions but, uh, you know, this is something that I think is important when I was building it to really think about how some of that would translate using, you know, a new technology like VR. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of having to use a new technology like this, if you've experienced VR, it's great, but I always have to sell VR as to why it's important. Uh, the problem with VR in the beginning when I was using it two and a half years ago is there wasn't much of a distribution and it was very hard to make the case of why we should invest in this and why we should work with this because it was hard to scale and to think about. But to me, it really was some of the early reactions we had with some of our street fundraisers. Uh, UNICEF's, one of their biggest sort of ways of making money is to have street fundraisers that stop you on the street in that way. And so this was our first sort of experiment to think, what would happen if we cut maybe a four minute version of Clouds Over Cedra, gave a cheap headset, a plastic sort of cardboard or plastic headset, and allowed them to stop you on the street and give you that experience and then ask you for money? Would there be a difference? And so we started working with these sort of volunteers and people that work in 40 different countries, translated into 15 different languages, and uh, we found that even the volunteers themselves would have a very interesting reaction to it. And this is some of the young people in New Zealand. And I won't play all of this, but just to give you a sense of why VR and the The girl in the video was only like a few years younger than me, and the boys running around were my brother's age. It gave me a real sense of appreciation for what I've got here. I felt as if I was actually there, and I could actually feel the pain of the children and their suffering made the people seem so alive and I think that's really important with this the people have to be alive in order for change to happen. For something that I, I don't want to believe is happening but I can't ignore it anymore. I knew about what was going on but I didn't really know the extent of everything that happened there. Open one arm and then the other and then walk towards a person and then hug them. What are you doing? Like. Why are basic human rights still being denied in the 21st century? Why are there still people falling, de falling dead on the streets? Why do humans feel the need for war? My sorrow is one based on, you know, me coming to school when it's raining. For them, it's not even being able to go to school. Yeah, it really makes you um, feel for what's happening in that situation. They said that it will kind of pass like the clouds, and I thought that was really inspiring. How they can just find happiness in a place where there's not going to be much. These were other girls like me going through it and actually thinking and feeling how they are feeling. There's just so much children who need our help and so much people we need to reach out to. So, you know, I got that video for the first time when we started doing it, and they made it, and they sent it to me for the reactions. And I think that was our first sort of aha moment that we're onto something. There's something going on, and what is it that we can do? And you know, we've been also able to get you know, very, very good sort of press uh, to get people excited about it. And you know, just want to you know, show that there is very unique sort of possibilities of impact campaigns of how you can use VR to do it. And so that's just some of what we've done um, and some of the statistics and it's ongoing. Like as we're sitting here, somebody in some country <laughs> is experiencing uh, clouds over Cedra on the street for the first time. 
and doubling donations, um, which is what I think is really exciting. And then we have then started using it in Canada with refugee resettlement because we thought, what would it, you know, there's a little bit of tension sometimes between host communities and recently arrived refugees. And so now we're doing kind of screenings led by refugees themselves that kind of build empathy and help connect them to services and get people motivated to not, you know, be xenophobic and horrible and all the other things that are happening. So that's called the CEDRA project that's happening in Canada and we piloted it and we have some very good results. And then we're looking to bring that into, um, right now we're in talks with Italy and in Germany and other places in Europe that you know, I think could be more challenging. Uh, we've also been very <coughs> fortunate to try to get this into many festivals because a lot of people can't necessarily experience VR or have you know, the uptake of mobile or even having a headset. There's still a lot of difficulties, but then there are all these other conferences where you know, we have the ability to bring it and it actually becomes sold out. It becomes this incredible thing, whether it's at Sundance or at Tribeca or even at the UN or even, you know, at other like high level places like the World Economic Forum or the White House where we've been fortunate to show some of our work. Um, this is just a little bit about what it looks like with these pop-ups. Uh, this is in Auckland of how people are, uh, how UNICEF is integrating it with people, uh, and then, you know, it, usually the rates are one in 12 people give to UNICEF on the streets if there's no virtual reality. If there's virtual reality, it's consistently showing that it's one in six people that are donating in doubling the rate of it. And this really helped build us, I, I, I don't know if it's true, but probably the first sort of ROI on, you know, <laughs> on VR and in some ways it could only happen because it wasn't in, in VR and it's really cool that somehow you can take the limitation and, and, and kind of make it your strength in some ways you know and somehow be creative to kind of think about new distribution models because there are these fundraisers and people and volunteers all over the world and somehow we were able to build a pipeline for distribution not only for Clouds of Cedra but now for all the other content in the series that we've done uh, on different topics um, that we've been a part of. Um, in uh, the other, you know, one final thing I think that's important on this thing, it's not just about money. Uh, we <laughs> also, you know, used our film, My Mother's Wing, on a film about a mother in Gaza um, who lost two of her children in a, a shelling in a UN school that was made to be a shelter. and it was then shown in the streets of Israel uh, in some ways. And it also was accepted in the Dakavi Film Festival and has really been a very gratifying experience to get people. And then we have a questionnaire and we're doing a little documentary about some of the reactions of ordinary people on the streets who know, have a very stereotypical view of what that conflict is about even though it's so close. And to have them kind of have that has been an incredible sort of data points and questionnaires about their sort of behavioral things on it. So there's many other things that you can do because in VR you end up getting a lot, it's even going to be more incredible because now you'll have heat maps and where they're looking and there's just all this data that I think is going to come out that will give you an understanding of what people are feeling and thinking. That is again only particular to VR, not necessarily something you can do with a, a YouTube video or something like that. Um, I wanted to, I should, what time is it? Like, I can, I have time? Okay, so, I mean another, I think what would be interesting, let's, so I'm not talking a little bit, is this, I have a behind the scenes, it's a minute and a half, about shooting in Gaza. The main point I wanna make about it is a lot of this, because it's new and difficult, you have to work with your subjects in a way that's unlike regular film, you know? Uh, regular film, you could shoot a lot, you have close-ups and you can do it. This is one where, you know, you, the simple act of like asking someone to walk to buy some vegetables, I have to do it seven times because one of the camera fails. Or This is the early days, it's getting a little better. Or it was the wrong distance or you can't control it in the same way because I can't necessarily see it. So this is just a short film in Gaza on what we were doing, how it works.
So I think that gives you a little bit of a sense of what it is that we're doing, and it's constantly changing. The, mo the more, most interesting thing on that is how important it is to have a headset to show people that you're working with of what you're trying to do. Uh, and that's always been the best sort of way to get people um, committed to work on these projects with us, because they have no idea what I'm talking about when I say VR. But then I'll show them some of our other films, and then right away, even people who haven't, you know, are going through all these difficult situations, they totally get it. They become the most, like, uh, they're like, absolutely. Like, let's, let's work on this, let's do it. And it's just been so heartening that no matter, it's this universal language that when people have that experience in some ways, they're like, okay, that's exactly, like, this is important, and this is something we'd like our story to be, to be told. So it's been very, very touching in that way. Um, we're almost done. And this is where the, the talk gets a little weird, you know? Gotta bring in a little weirdness, you know, in that way. Um, you know, I grew up in, um, New York City. I'm, I'm born and raised there. And I grew up in the borough of Queens, um, which is now getting hip, but not a very hip area historically. A more kind of working class area that um, I grew up in. So what I was alluding to is I didn't grow up in a very sophisticated environment. So I didn't really have sushi until I was like 20, you know, in college. And like I was discovering all these bourgeois things that <clears throat> are really great now that I'm glad I did. But when you actually go through it, it's this incredible experience. And for me, a lot of it was in discovering wine. And this is Dionysios. Um, and I put it up there because in some ways, in my first experience with something that was blowing my mind and all these things were happening to me, um, I really felt it was important, and it was someone who, I went to Burgundy, which was in France, which is like, I guess, the mecca of wine in some ways, um, and I was given a wine dictionary, and to me, that really helped me in some ways, to be able to describe and think about what I was going through, and in turn, it made me appreciate what I was doing and actually explore and understand and become a better expert of what was happening. And I think there's similar things in VR. I think the vocabulary that we use and what we're trying to do is, is really, really um, important. And I bring this wine metaphor also because it was on one of those trips that um, my son was conceived. Uh, uh, and his middle name is Dionysios, uh, which is uh, incredible. And I should have a slide of him in here because it really is this, this wine Dionysios journey that's uh, you know, brought him to life, which is really beautiful. Um, you can keep going on this. It gets absurd with the different sort of ways you can describe wine. And I think, you know, in, in VR, I think the big word that I think that I was taught from the beginning to kind of understand what I was doing is this concept of presence. And, you know, uh, in regular other ways, when you design for something, this is where it gets practical, so you're gonna get very excited, right? Because you're, ex you know, we're gonna, no more philosophy, just practical shit now, right? Um, how do you design for presence? Uh, I think that's really important. I think there's a lot of emphasis on storytelling, but when I was building something, I realized on a parallel track, there were certain shots that I wanted and needed to have in there that maybe didn't tie to the story in some ways, but they tied to my feeling of presence. They tied to my feeling of being there and, and to root me into an experience. And I think there's different ways that you can build that. Uh, and, you know, a big part of it, of course, is, and, and people have mentioned this, is sound as well. So it's not just necessarily a visual thing. If you hear things and the spatial sound behind you, it just hacks your senses and tricks your brain. And in some ways, it's important to think about there being a point to what you're doing and having that traditional linear narrative. But I think there's so much of it that's non-linear and mysterious that I've kept certain scenes that I just think are non sequiturs, but they just give you this incredible visceral feeling. And that's really hard. And that's something I think you have to kind of play around with because our traditional general way is to be very linear. And I think Something about VR is also very non-linear, where you're going to have to experiment with that. Uh, you know, in traditional cinema, another way that you're able to bring presence is this way. 
where it's very loud, sorry. Um, where you know this is this is um, a scene. I think Jason, this is for you because he's a, a film buff. Uh, but this is from Summer of Monica with Ingmar Bergman, and this is I think considered it's debatable, but considered to be one of the first times that when someone broke the kind of fourth wall and looks at you. And I think that kind of sort of trope also in VR works profoundly well. And I think what actually is important is to understand she's looking at you, but you didn't expect her to look at you. In VR, you can play around with whether you're a fly on the wall or whether you're part of something and also play on that surprise in some ways because you might just feel like a voyeur and feel disarmed and all of a sudden some child looks at you and you feel this sense of vulnerability uh, in some ways. And then again, I think that's very important for building you know, presence. Uh, a lot of, you know, even regular cinema with Altman, with a lot of his work on sound uh, is quite extraordinary, like just as this as an example. You could turn this up a little bit louder. Let's see. So, you know, you're... Yeah, so you hear, you hear the microphone at the, the table with the poker chips and the cards, but you see something else. And there's, you know, a lot of what he's been able to use of that kind of juxtaposition that I think also in VR is yet to be explored, but just kind of shows that we can be creative on how we could use spatialized sound and what we can build in that. That's not just on the nose in that way. Uh, this is, you know, flattened versions of Clouds Over Cedra. Uh, camera height, I think, like someone has mentioned, I think is also really important. You know, and I think there's something about using that. Uh, you think you're invisible, but then kids come at you. And I think some of that, this is of course not VR, it's flattened, so you, should, you probably know that, but just to give you a sense of how you can do it. People talking to you, you know, all those other things I think have a different way of building your sort of ability to be there. This was interesting. This is a conscious decision to make the camera higher, assuming that most people are adults doing VR, so that you look down at, like you, you almost feel like the kids are around you. And it would have been very different if you were eye level in that way. And I think giving that sort of sensation, you know, led to, to those type of things. Um, so, uh, you know, most of my work and a lot of it in building presence was in 360 and it's stereoscopic and there's binaural sound. And at some point, you know, I just felt, what is the holy grail of VR? I mean, the holy grail of VR is that you would want to be able to walk around a live action movie, that it would actually feel like what it feels like here in doing it. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be almost, I'm almost done just playing this thing. And I think uh, the, my most recent experience, The Last Goodbye, which I don't know if there's a demo here, but maybe there's another way you could see it. It's in a Vive. It was trying to say how we could at least build that. The technology isn't here, but what are some of the tools to kind of hack and to do that? So we used a photogrammetry base um, where we took, you know, 10,000 pictures of a space, and we were then able to take that and composite it so that it felt like with the dimensions that you were in these spaces, and in this case, in a concentration camp. So the scratches you would see in the rooms are the scratches that are there. And it's as photorealistic as we can make it with your ability to walk around it. The other challenge was how do you bring in human beings? Because the spaces are one thing, but it's very hard in a volumetric way to bring someone in. So we were able to make a stereo card um, and build in you know, using two A7s, building a kind of depth to a character and bounding him in the corner so there aren't any parallax issues. And in some ways, you can kind of feel tricked or you're using like almost like a little bit of a, a visual cue that you can kind of get people to um, go on this tour with him on that. And so the final thing I wanted to leave, it's another minute video, is just a little bit of what some of shooting that was and what that story is about.
I make virtual reality films in 360 degrees, stuff you can watch in a headset. My other films have been on pretty big, serious social issues, like the refugee crisis, the Ebola crisis. Most of my films up until now, they bring you into another world, but it's not a world you can necessarily walk around. And this project is, you know, really pushing the boundaries of what it means to be in virtual reality. I really felt this type of technology would be really powerful for genocide survivors. There's this need for testimony. There's this need to, to share. There's this need to educate, but also to bring you there and to have them take you there. Pincus was one of the few people to survive this camp. I mean, today we film in the shower room that he was brought when he was 11 years old on the day that his, the rest of his family members were killed. And in the experience, you're going to be in the shower room with him. Up until now, if you need to move around in virtual reality, they're usually computer-generated images. This project gave us the possibility to explore with some cutting edge technology, what it would be like to be in a certain place, but also with someone else who would be able to be your guide. You are able to be confined to a certain space. And with a headset, you can explore that space. And it really is hacking your senses. You know, I think these types of experiences, they will give a different type of feeling that one doesn't get in traditional documentary or traditional film. Great, thank you.